Welcome back to another off-grid power inverter review. Each week I have many companies offer to send me inverters, batteries, and portable power stations to test out on my channel, but like I said in previous videos, 95-98% to of those offers are declined. Many of those companies say they're looking for influencers, and that I'm not. I test out the product and I'll tell you if it's good or bad. Or once I get the product, if it's really poor, I will not show it at all. This particular inverter is a 3000 watt continuous rating with a 6000 watt surge. It's a pure sine wave inverter. This inverter can be purchased having a 12 volt, 24 volt, or 48 volt input, and the output is 110 or 220. The housing for this inverter is made out of aluminum or aluminium if you're British. This inverter weighs around 6 kilograms or 13 pounds. Now the version I'm going to be testing has a 12 volt DC input and a 120 volt AC output. Many of the products shown on my channel, some that I purchase, some that I request, or some that are offered to me, just like the majority of YouTube channels, I usually have affiliate links placed in the video description area. So if you see a product shown in my video or a tool that I'm using, if you decide to purchase it, I can get a very small cut to help support the creation of new videos on my channel. Now before I perform extensive tests on this unit, open it up, show you the inside, what I'd like to do first is take this outside and we're going to test it first. Make sure it has the ability to supply 3000 watts continuously. I also want to see how good it can handle surges. Over here you can see there's one AC receptacle. I would have liked to have seen more than one, it's not a big deal. You can always take one of these adapters, plug it in, and then you'll have three. Over here you have a terminal block, so if you're going to be connecting this up to wiring, you're going to take your two wires, insert them underneath this cover, use the screws to set the wire in position. The next thing I see is that the receptacle is a little too close to this terminal block that if you wanted to connect this inverter directly to wiring. So most things that you plug in, you'll have no problem plugging in. But if you have anything that has like a little power pack attached to it, you're not going to be able to plug it directly in because it's going to hit this right here. So you would definitely have to use this first in order to do that. This unit shows you the AC output voltage and the DC input voltage. It operates very similar to the reliable inverter, the way the alarm is set up. It has low voltage cutoff, high voltage cutoff, over temp, it has all those different features. And over here you can see it has a modular jack. And the purpose of that jack is to plug in this cable you see right here. You can mount this panel when you walk inside of a solar shed or any other area. And then you'll be able to turn the unit on as soon as you walk into the room. Included with this unit you get these cables that were put together. And I checked these over here, I scratched them. And it's definitely copper, so it's tinned copper lugs. And each one of these wires is solid copper. I looked at the very end and side where you can see the copper where it was cut and it's the copper color throughout so it's definitely not copper over aluminum. Now the one thing about these wires they appear to be number six gauge. I would have liked to seen them number four. If they were number four then three of these together would be no problem at all to supply up to 300 amps to this inverter. So this is a little undersized for this unit. It'll probably handle 220 with no problem but when you get above that, it's probably going to get very warm. If this was a 24 volt model, these would be no problem at all because the current going into this inverter would be half the amount. The inverter is mounted at each end. You can see the openings. I'll spin it around. On the rear, we have two more openings in that sheet metal to secure the inverter. Two cooling fans and over here is your positive connection and negative. Now over here, the bolts that secure the cables to this point and that point, I would have liked to have seen these in brass, as well as the nut and the washer. It'll be a lower resistance connection. You'll have less heating. When I do test this, I'm going to see if this gets hot. If it just gets a little warm like the rest of the unit, that's not a problem. But I will let you know if it heats up when I test the unit. Okay, we're all connected up. I have my 4D lead acid deep cycle battery connected up to the inverter. I chose not to use the cables that were included, but the ones that I showed you how to make in a previous video. They're much thicker, they're 4 watt, and can handle a lot of current. For the first test, I want to see how well this inverter can handle inductive loads for high inrush currents. 
So I have a rigid circular saw, a delta industrial chop saw, and that's the exact same chop saw that the reliable brand inverter could not start. So we're going to see if this unit is able to do that. And we're also going to connect up a microwave oven. For the first test, I'm going to be using the rigid circular saw. And now let's give it a try. As you just saw, both attempts, no problem at all. The first thing I noticed is that this power inverter has a built-in soft start. Now let's try the Delta chop saw. The chop saw is now connected up, and as you can see, because this is a lead acid battery, I want to keep the voltage up, so I have my charger connected to the battery. Let's give the chop saw a try. And one more time. And it powers the chop saw up just fine. Now let's try the microwave oven. There's a cup of water inside. We'll let it run for about 30 seconds. A very heavy load and it's working very well. The lead acid battery of course does not hold up to the current as well at high levels compared to the lithium iron phosphate battery. Okay. And that is pretty hot. So that works just fine too. This time I'm going to turn the microwave oven on to see how much current is going through the cables into the back of the inverter. And as you can see on the digital clamp meter, we're pulling right around 170 amps. For the next test, I'll be adding a power receptacle to the terminal block to distribute the load better to see if the inverter can supply 3000 watts. If it can, I'll let it run for 10 to 15 minutes to make sure the inverter doesn't overheat. I'll be using a hairdryer set to maximum heat, which draws around 1650 watts. and a heat gun that draws around 1350 on the 1000 degree Fahrenheit setting. The heat gun and the hair dryer will be used simultaneously to place a load at or near 3000 watts. Because the current is extremely high, I'll only be able to test the load for 10 to 15 minutes. You can see under that heavy load, the input voltage is already down to 10.6 volts, and the AC output voltage is 110 volts, if the input voltage was higher, the AC output would also be higher. Here you can see the current draw of 285 amps, and because the voltage input is getting too low, the AC voltage output is also starting to fall below 110. And there was no problem at all supplying that load for 12 minutes. The inverter is warm to very warm to the touch, no hot areas. So what I'd like to do is connect up a power supply to the left side of this inverter, and I want to turn it on and see what the standby current is for the inverter. With the inverter powered on, with nothing connected to it, you can see at 12.7 volts we're drawing an average of around 680 to 700 milliamps. Now let's check the output to see if it's 60 hertz and if it's sine wave. With the probes connected to the AC output, over here you can see 59.72 hertz. Just a little bit under that 60 hertz output. With the oscilloscope connected to the AC output from the inverter, you can see 122 volts, and you can see the sine wave waveform. Now let's try the remote switch to make sure it works. Let's turn it off. Everything's off. 
and we have the display here and there to match the LEDs on the unit. So this works fine. Now we're going to test the low voltage cutoff and the high voltage cutoff and I want to see how much it has to recover from the low and how much it has to drop from the high to get the inverter to go back on. Let's start by going lower. Let's drop this down to 11.7. Let's put this down to 11.2. Ten volts. Ten volts. All right. So right around ten or ten point one. Let's slowly increase. Let's go to eleven. See if it comes back. Nope. Eleven point two. Twelve point five. So the voltage has to climb back up around two and a half volts to get the unit to power back up. Now let's test the high end. Fourteen five. Keep going. Let's go to fourteen seven. Fourteen nine. Oh, 15. 15, it's off. And it's going to vary a little bit when it's under a load, but we know it works. Let's see how much we have to go on the top end to drop to get it to come back on. Oh, not much. So the top end, you only have to drop around 0.2 to get it to recover. The bottom end, you got to bring the battery voltage way up, which actually makes sense because you don't want to be using a battery. If it's down at 10 volts, you want to charge it back up to that 12.5 range. So the low cutoff and the high definitely works. Now I don't have to test the fans because when I was outside testing under load, the fans activated and then they turned off when the unit cooled down. So I know the fans definitely work. Now the one other thing is the overload and short circuit of the output. Now I do not recommend anybody short circuit the output of their inverter just like you would not want to do it in your home. It's not good. It puts a lot of strain on the unit and sometimes the circuitry will not do its job as I found in other devices that I've tested and you will blow some MOSFETs inside. So it's a very foolish thing to try shorting the output. What I recommend that you do if you think there's a chance that you may short the output is to install a push button circuit breaker like you see right here. 25 amps would handle up to 3,000 watts. All you have to do is take the blades, open up one side of the receptacle, and connect this in series. Drill a small hole, and you'll have the button right here sticking up that you can reset in the event that there's a short circuit. And that's exactly what I would do if you're concerned about shorting the AC output. This breaker is designed for up to 32 volts DC or 125 to 250 volts AC. To make it easier for you to find these, I'll place a link in the video description area. Okay, the last thing I want to do is open up the unit so we can take a look inside. With the top cover removed, you can see the inside of the inverter. And just like many other inverters that I've taken apart, you can see the positive and negative uses multiple wires going to different points on the board. This one has one, two, three, four, five transformers, and it says 3200 watt, 12 volt, 110. Each one of those locations has two 40 amp fuses in parallel. One behind there. As you can see, the heat sinks are very large. And the temperature sensor is on this one right here. Now you would think there would be more than one sensor, but the components on this heat sink here probably get hotter than the ones on this side, and that's why the temperature sensor is located here. You can see there's a large inductor and capacitor on that AC output, which is used for filtering. If you look over here at this image, you're going to see the wire from the receptacle goes to the back side of this plate, and that's where the metal screw with the nut is, so you would have a rod inserted into the ground. That wire would connect to the opposite side of this plate, 
and it would feed through to the ground on the receptacle. Everything here looks okay. They have glue on certain things to keep them from coming out. This little board here is the alarm board. You can see it has the piezo element on it, or piezo alarm. And let me just spin it around to show you the opposite side. Here you can see a whole bunch of non-polar capacitors stacked up. And another board. More than likely the inverter control board. I don't see any major issues and if you wanted to add the circuit breaker on the AC output you could disconnect the red here. The red over here which goes to the terminal block. They're coming from the same location on the circuit board and you would just get the two of those, connect them together and those two wires would connect to one side of the circuit breaker and the other side of the circuit breaker would connect back to the receptacle and the terminal block. Not a bad inverter compared to some of the other ones that I've seen in the past. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to rate, thumbs up, share, and check out my extensive video playlist for many other videos of interest to you. Thanks for watching.